Okay, and we are live on Facebook. Hello, ACPA community. My name is Bethany Tagnacci, and I use the she and her pronouns. I am ACPA's Director of Marketing Communications in the International Office, and I'm grateful to have our panelists and viewers here today for our ACPA Day Black Lives Matter panel featuring Monique Ackerley, Shauna, Shauna Patterson-Stevens, and Nicole Whitmer. ACPA turns 96 years old today, and in the past, ACPA Day was a way to celebrate our history, promote our educational offerings, and gain excitement for the future. But this year, given everything that has transpired in 2020, we found little space to celebrate. Today, ACPA Day will focus on uplifting the voices, experiences, and scholarship of our Black student affairs and higher education colleagues. ACPA believes that Black Lives Matter, and we vow to showcase how our Black colleagues are boldly transforming higher education today and every day. We would like to begin with our ACPA land acknowledgement. ACPA College Student Educators International is the leading comprehensive student affairs association that advances higher education and engages students for a lifetime of learning and discovery. Although serving an international audience, our membership is primarily from the United States and our offices are headquartered in Washington, DC at the National Center for Higher Education. Related to our mission of supporting and fostering learning through generation and sharing of knowledge, ACPA acknowledges the painful history of genocide in the United States for native Aboriginal and indigenous peoples. We honor and forcefully remove as well as those still connected to this land. We particularly acknowledge and recognize the land upon which our international headquarters is located today as long served as a site of meeting and exchange among a number of indigenous people, including the Akahanic, Pokemok, Piscataway, Anacostank, Mattapaniant, Nangamunk, Pamunkey, Tawihunt, Nanticoke, Chickahominy, Monacoon, Maniponi, Nansimund, Rappahannock, Ani, Stohini, Unami, and Assateague tribal nations as the original occupants of the Washington DC region. ACPA strongly advocates for higher education and student affairs professionals to honor the land, the original tribal occupants, and the history of the place where you are located. Further, we have a responsibility to continually self-educate, reflect, and listen to the stories and people in our areas, including tribal land acknowledgements in practice and understanding and acknowledging history is not only respectful and educational, it is the justice oriented advocacy necessary for continuing the work of dismantling the devastating effects of settler colonialism, colonialism in our society. We'd also like to share that this session is being recorded and captioned live here on Facebook. A version with embedded captions will be available within 24 hours in our Facebook video library. Thank you again to everyone who is joining live. And I would, I would now like to turn it over to our panelists to introduce themselves. All right, good afternoon. It is wonderful to be in space with you all. Before we do introductions, we actually just wanna to come together and just hold a quick moment of silence. We wanna hold a moment of silence to acknowledge the physical, emotional, and spiritual impacts of the continual violence against black and brown bodies and the ways that folks continue to show up through pain to fight against oppressive systems, to be able to attain liberation and maintain their joy. So please join us for a moment of silence. Thank you so much. So good afternoon again. My name is Monique Atherley. My pronouns are she or they, and I serve as the immediate past chair for the Pan-African Network. And I'm also the entity award coordinator on behalf of the ACPA Awards Committee. I'll allow the other panelists and in, in, um, introduce themselves. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Shauna Patterson, Stephen, she, her, hers, and I'm currently the, the member at large senior level for ACPA. And good morning from the West Coast. My name is Nicole Whitner, and I am the Assembly Coordinator for State and Regional Chapters, and I also serve as the Dean of Students at Holy Names University in Oakland, California. 
And I actually have the pleasure of asking the first question of our team. So we're each gonna ask a question. We'll take a little time to answer um, and hopefully you all will be engaging in the chat as we converse with each other. Um, so I'm gonna ask my crew here, who were some of your most significant influences and or mentors in your career and why? I can start. Um, I uh, am originally uh, from a background where I'm first gen. Um, my family was in the military. We moved around a lot. Uh, what that meant was that, you know, I have a very hard line or I, was, I grew up with a very hard line understanding of what it meant to uh, uh, engage in discipline, um, to engage in respecting authority. Um, and, and that also caused me to rebel against those concepts. And so when I was in grad school, I had um, a very interesting perspective on what it meant to take up space as a black woman in the classroom. I was one that was a little more, um, you know, uh, the word that was used to describe me at the time, rough around the edges. Um, and it was uh, folks like James Minor, uh, who was able to communicate to me in a way that I could actually understand what was needed. Um, it was folks like Joshua Gillespie, who uh, was my, my, uh, my supervisor at the time at Michigan State University. Um, my other previous supervisor, Kelly Hermacord, um, they were all black folks. Um, and they were all people who were willing to understand what it meant to uh, be in my perspective and to be in my shoes and to uh, traverse Michigan State as a first gen person who was walking around with a very faint understanding of, of how the political structures were set up um, and were able to speak to me in a way where I didn't have to read between the lines because they understood that's where I was in my development at the time. Uh, they saw the potential in me sometimes when no one else did. Um, and it was from my guidance and those conversations that I had with them that I was able to um, really think about what it was that I wanted to do within the context of my own lived experience. Um, and it was not, uh, those conversations weren't uh, written or documented or um, uh, engaged in a way that was asking me to be someone I wasn't. Uh, they were just trying to help me be the best person I could be so that I wasn't in, standing in my own way. Um, I think this is a little more uh, cheesy, but uh, honestly, if it weren't for the birth of my daughter, um, I, I think I might also be in a very different, uh, maybe even field right now. Uh, this person came into my life and helped me to empathize in ways that I, I just never did before. Um, she really encouraged me to want to be a better person. Um, and in being a better person, of course, I became a better professional. And so I, I think another turning point in my life, it, it was um, the birth of my daughter and then the uh, continued love and support I received from a lot of peer mentors in the field. My mute wasn't working. I really value what you said, Shona, about you know not trying to change you and really just being able to help you get out your own way so your light could shine bright. So when I was reflecting on this, I really had to think about how Black women have just saved my life and continue to do so. Um, and there's three particular folks who along the journey that were really uh, pivotal to me in regards to just getting to where I am now. So first, I'll think about uh, Barbara Harrison McBee, who's actually the executive uh, assistant to the Vice President of Student Affairs at SUNY College out of Westbury. And I remember when I started as a residence hall director on the first day of work, I was late. I graduated into a recession. I didn't have a GPS. I didn't have a car. So I was at the mercy of who was bringing me to work and we got lost and they tried to fire me on my first day at work. And if it wasn't for Barbara going behind the scenes and just kind of like finessing and you know calming people down because they were very anti young professional. They felt that young professionals, you know, they feel they can do whatever they want to do. Uh, this is in the beginning of like the millennial research and you know all that like the millennial bias was growing. Uh, but for her, she felt it was really important to pay for what folks had done to her. And I remember sitting with her one-on-one -on -one and she had mentioned to me that if someone didn't take a chance on me, where would I be? And that's exactly what she wanted to do for me. And I've always just maintained that as a way that I, I practice when I work with students 
I work with paraprofessionals, you know, if someone didn't take a chance on me to be able to see past me being late, which wasn't my fault, but past that, where would I be? And where would I be able to share my light and to impact the way that I've been impacting people over the last couple of years? Um, next person is Tiana McFarland, who is actually my supervisor at the New York Urban League. She currently works for the Department of Education in New York City. And what was important about Tiana that I got from her was that she was my supervisor in like the hardest time of my life. So my mom had two strokes and my dad had passed away in a span of seven months. And you can only imagine what it's like to be a supervisor for someone when their life is like completely crumbling. But, you know, watching her supervise me during that season really taught me a lot about supervision and how there is space for humanity in the workplace. So much so that I teach a course now on human relations and that's the framing concept for my class. We ask, you know, is there room for humanity in the workplace? Because a lot of places they ask you to choose and you can't choose when you're working with people. We all have a lot of life. 2020 has taught us that and it has taught us that we have to keep humanity and our people at the forefront of all of our operations or else we won't have operations. So for me, it was just a great example to be able to look and see that you can be an excellent supervisor, you can cover folks and you can also empower them even when they're in a trial um, that they not, they're not sure how they're going to navigate out of. And then finally, I would say my most recent supervisor, Dr. Karen uh, Williams from LaGuardia Community College. Uh, she's the deputy to the Vice President of Student Affairs and the Associate Provost. And what I like love so much about working with Dr. Williams is that she is her authentic self every single place she shows up in. And that's just the level of just like gangster I wanna walk into just different spaces with. Because so often in the beginning of my career, I felt like I had to choose, right? I had to choose who I had to be or how I had to show up in a space to be able to be looked as a person who could bring value uh, to the space, which is unfair because that's not how we treat our students. So when I watch her move and I watch her do the, the things that she does, she's very true to herself as a woman from the Bronx, from Caribbean heritage, and she's able to be a true connector to people and also allow folks to shine their own lights. So for me, when I think about those folks who just have impact me from a distance, is what, what can I take from their level of leadership, whether it be outwardly leadership or just passive leadership to be able to continue to just reverberate that energy that they've given to me. Those are great answers. Thank you both for answering that question. So I have a question. Um, how does race influence your leadership and relationships in higher education? So this one, I think, is particularly salient for me right now at this point in my career. Um, I, you know, I echo all that Monique was saying about the conversations about millennials in the workplace because we're often the scapegoat and I'm like, whatever, I'm here, I'm gonna do what I can do. Um, but it's so interesting at this point to be um, in a leadership position in a very visible leadership position as the Dean of Students at an institution that has a larger percentage of, like we're a majority minority institution, we're HSI. We have a lot of students of color and a lot of black students. And I haven't yet had the chance to be in that environment until I joined this institution last year. And that was when it really hit me that me being me in my position makes a difference to some people. Me just showing up in my skin, with my identity, with whatever I bring to the table, just that part without all of the qualifiers of what I've done and who I know um, has made an impact. And I had never really sat with that until I've stepped into this role. And it's been huge. It's been not just a moment of like trying to be cognizant of my influence and, and leverage and all of the things we talk about in a like business or career oriented aspect, but really, in my relationship building, it has been very symbiotic for me to have these really great relationships with our students and for them to look to me as a resource because I'm representative of something that they want, whether that's like educational goals or career goals. That has been, I, I can't even, I can't even qualify it. Um, there have been moments where the job itself were was really difficult. Um, moments where I was struggling to communicate with colleagues or to get what I felt like I needed for my team or my department. And the thing that made it bearable was my BSU students just bobbling into my office like, hey doc, how you doing? You know, sitting on my couch and, and having no clue 
what is going on with me like emotionally and professionally, but in just coming to me because that was a moment they needed and it, I realized it was also a moment I needed. Um, and so I recognize that showing up as a black woman, it is making a huge impact. Um, and sometimes that's enough, um, even when it doesn't feel like it, like sometimes for other, for people it's enough. Um, so that has been huge for me. And I appreciate that. I think it's definitely the same thing, just being able to show up as you are. And sometimes I think about it, the good and the bad, right? Because just showing up is enough, but it's also just like a, a level of weight that I sometimes feel uh, with identities I hold in the tables I sit at. So for me, I think about, you know, any table I'm at, I'm making sure to advocate on behalf of our communities because I know where I exist and kind of the structure of things that are going on. And I think it's really important to bring these lived experiences of folks to the table so they know that, particularly in a pandemic, that things are rough, right? And it, it's not normal as usual for many of us. And normal will never exist again. And normal wasn't working for most of us. And if someone doesn't come to the table and be, is able to articulate that and articulate what folks are experiencing, we'll continue doing the things that just don't make sense before and still don't make sense now. So I appreciate so much of what you're mentioning about just showing up as you are. I think about uh, myself uh, duly looking at my faculty role. So I've been a faculty member since about 2019 for the CUNY School of Professional Studies. And I am one of three Black women in the department and I'm the youngest person in the department. And I don't take that lightly at all because also with our School of Professional Studies, we have a lot of transfer students. I work in community college. So I have a lot of students I work with in the community college. I have a lot of non-traditional students, a lot of adult learners, and you know a lot of folks who are first gen, even with all of those other things going on. And just being able to be in this space with them and show them a level of something to aspire to, to let them know it can be done. It doesn't matter when they started school, they can complete and they can be marvelous. Um, it's just really important for me. I, I take that so much to heart when I do this work. Um, and I think it's really important to be able to just, you know, connect with the students where they're at and just being able to support them uh, from these particular identities. So even I'll mention my current role, I've been at LaGuardia Community College for the last three years. And LaGuardia Community College is actually like my home school, right? My sister went there in the 90s. Like if I didn't go to a four year school, I would have ended up in LaGuardia. And it completely changed my experience as a professional because now I'm, I'm back home, right? It is my duty and my responsibility to be able to offer them the opportunities that they may not think exist, but I am the living testimony that it can happen. Um, so I often just think about, you know, the different identities we hold of where folks are at the margin, ways that, particularly with some of the programs I work with, ways that I can help them become better advocates for themselves while also advocating for them um, at the table. And you both alluded to this, so just kind of a follow up to that um, and thinking about our nuanced understandings of identity. Um, what are some of the strategies you have been using to navigate higher education as a system, as a space um, for folks that are still trying to understand the best way to contend with the politics that are involved with the ways that our identity interact with higher education? I'm laughing because um, there's <laughs> There's so many layers to that. I, um, you know, it just, you go back to the Malcolm X, the least protected human in the United States as a black woman, right? So you're, you're teetering on this balance of being assertive and being vocal and using your, you know, well-earned position and education to leverage what you feel is necessary for you know the role that you play. So for me, it's advocating for my students, um, but you also don't want to come off as aggressive or come off as you know all of the negative words that are utilized um, to kind of silence us. And so it's a delicate balance, and it and there are those moments of of frustration because you feel like you're just wedged between a rock and a hard place that there really isn't a solid ideal solution or outcome on this road that you're traveling because you know how you will be perceived, um, even if how you will be perceived is not who you are or how you are. Um, and so I feel really fortunate to, you know, I feel like, you know, having a team being surrounded by people who see you for who you are and are not committed to misunderstanding you makes a difference when folks in other spaces are in that mindset. So I have a supervisor who I can vent to and say like, this is difficult. And even 
as not being a person of color herself, she gets it. I don't have to decode what I'm trying to say. And similarly, I have a staff team who understand it and understand the importance of that in the community that we serve. And so that it's almost like a cushion around me. It's like pillows on the side as I'm trying to like figure this out um, and fight it out because there will be those interactions where it's clear that me showing up as important as it is to certain people in my community, it becomes a problem to others. Um, and, you know, I feel like, sometimes I feel like we're built for this as hard as it is to do. Sometimes I feel like if there's anybody who was going to get through it, it would be us as black women. Um, and I don't have any scientific data to back that up. I just have my experience, right? This is kind of hard. Um, I think about, you know, for me, I work in a very large bureaucratic system. So that's why this is a very difficult question to navigate because I've worked in uh, three colleges for the system. And it's all very different experiences, very different experiences. So for me, I, I really try to always remain purpose-based because a lot of times I will end up dealing with the red tape of the system that has nothing to do with anything, even though we, they claim to be of support to certain folks in the, in the system. Um, so I really try to remain close to purpose and to remain encouraged in purpose because because of the red tape, it's often a run around and things are a lot harder than they need to be. So also with that, for me, I'm 72% I'm introvert, even though folks do not realize that about me. I like to uh, connect and make relationships with folks um, and also just kind of be tactical. So even though I am a millennial, I, I, have a, I have the favor of the old heads in most spaces that I go to. So I like to be able to just engage with the folks who have been there for many years and just you know gain the institutional knowledge from them and be able to look at maybe what are some of their dreams and aspirations for work that hasn't been done yet and really be able to partner in a, a meaningful way. So for me, like, it, it's kind of like tactical and strategic because I know I'm focusing on purpose. But again, I really want to be able to just build and understand what are we trying to do here? And if we're really saying we want to do this, are we actually doing it? And then if we're not doing it, how can we actually do it? So in the end of the day, it ends up being what I wanna do because I kind of went through the, you see what I'm saying? I kind of went through the process of making seem that I was being influenced by certain things, but I was really trying to get to the end goal. So me, it's really just trying to just really connect and understand and really figure out ways that even in the scope of doing, wanting to do larger work, if I can't do the biggest thing, what is the smallest thing I could do out of this? How can I still impact? How can I still take care of the lives in my care to make sure that they know that they're seen, that they're loved, that someone is fighting for them just as hard as they're fighting to get through their classes and someone is really trying to be able to make their experience better. And I know it's easier said than done, um, especially for those of us that don't have the cushions around us, you know, that we need and deserve. Um, I think something I'd like to plug is also if you find yourself in a situation for those of you that are um, listening to our discussion, um, needing some additional support or advice or care and it's not available on your campus to plug into the Pan-African Network and ACPA because if you can't find it at your institution, you'll definitely find it there. Thank you, Madam Past Chair. Um, so <laughs> All right, so I'll go ahead and uh, jump into our next question. So what would you want people who are not members of ACPA to know about the strategic imperative for racial justice and decolonization? I can start um, and I probably will piggyback then later. Um, first, I think it's important to note that um, something that ACPA is really diligent about doing is ensuring that uh, folks understand that the uplift and the, the lifting of this initiative is not just beholden to the folks in IO or the governing board, but this is something that we really hope members understand is their responsibility as uh, practitioners in the field and, and also trying to give folks the support and the resources they need to help carry it forward. Um, and, and our thought process behind it is that if we can make these changes in ACPA, um, 
an organization that many folks don't realize emerged out of a social a need for social change and social justice because there were folks that were present in student affairs and as practitioners and scholars who could not enter into NASPA. Um, so we created our own organization. So we started out of an understanding of the need for social change and um, we're broadening that to an understanding of what decolonization means and understanding what indigeneity means in higher ed um, and understanding what racial justice actually means in our policies and our curriculum in our practice. And if we can make these changes in this association, um, our hope is that we can also plant the seed for helping folks do that on their respective campuses as well and actually create systemic social change throughout higher education. And so something that I want to note is that, you know, as we're creating these initiatives, as we're thinking through uh, critically what it means to engage in this work in in our programs at the convention or in our literature in the journals or in the ways that we go about socializing uh, professionals through the professional development opportunities we offer as an association. Our hope is that at the end of the day, folks are taking what they're learning from the association and trying to find ways to plant those seeds in the ground at their respective institutions as well. Yeah, and I would piggyback off of that to just say, you know, I think especially this year, this crazy year, we have seen how all kinds of organizations and institutions have tried to be responsive to what's happening specifically to the Black community in the United States. And there has always been this question of authenticity of whether they're doing it because it's a movement or whether they're doing it because they actually are interested in seeing liberation uh, for Black folks and people of communities of color that are being marginalized. And when I look at the strategic imperative and when I engage in spaces in ACPA, whether that's via the governing board or at convention, which I'm so glad that we actually had convention this year um yeah it was it was important but it, regardless of where i am it's clear that it is a constant lens through which we are looking at everything we do and all the ways we engage and it's not just lip service it's not one of those things that's written into a mission um and you never looked at again like so we see some institutions do um, it's genuinely a an imperative it is embedded into all of the work that we do and it has really pushed me to be even more critical in the way that I am engaging in my practice on my campus and in all of the communities that I enter. And I hope that folks would feel like they can look at that and feel that there's components of it that resonate with them um, and that there are things that they would want to do to continue to advance the strategic imperative because this is a starting point we're not done. Like the fact that we issued the strategic imperative doesn't mean that we suddenly are that much greater of an inst as, of an organization and we're ahead of all of our colleagues because there is actual work to do behind it. And we hope that folks who are not members will look at that and think that there's something they can do to contribute to it. Definitely. I think one thing I also took out of what you just said, Nicole, was looking at moving from lip service to implementation, right? And you know, when I think about the strategic imperative, even when it came out in the institution that I was at, you know, we have to have these critical conversations with ourselves because we, we're not as great as we think we are sometimes, right? And it's really important for us to reflect and to really check ourselves and call out the things that need to be called out if we're really going to sit here and say that we're boldly uh, transforming higher education, right? If we're, we're actually doing the work of what education was purpose for and serving the folks who are supposed to be purpose or served in this work. Um, so I really appreciated that. So another question uh, that came up, you know, thinking about, you know, and I appreciate what you said, Nicole, about having convention, because I am so grateful to have seen you all <laughs> earlier in March. Like it's really sustained me since then, because who knew? Like we really, we really didn't know what the world would look like months later. Um, so what, how have you maintained or found joy along this higher education journey or even in the last few months? I can just jump in. If you see behind me, there's lots of paintings. I was a huge connoisseur of paint night when we weren't sheltered in place. Um, I've done at least once since that it was socially distant and outdoors, um, but just trying to find ways to be creative. Um, whether that is painting or you know writing or reading um just 
trying to stay engaged and connected to myself, <laughs> um, which you get a lot of time to yourself when you don't get to go anywhere. But um, I think that's been necessary, like highly necessary to engage with the people who I love. You know, I, when Insecure was on, I had a weekly meeting with my friends and we talked about the show and then we picked up other shows to keep that going. Like those moments um, have been really important for me. Um, I follow the nap ministry, you know, and so um, understanding the power of rest and also I would add to that what it means to completely disconnect and actually try to center yourself. I'm one of those people, uh, if you do follow me on social media, you'll notice that I might have something up once a month, maybe, you know, um, that's because I actually go through the process of logging out of social media, not just um, going off of the app or uh, removing um, the the cue from my my um, screen, I actually completely log out and I won't come back for a while. Um, and that is because I'm trying to protect my peace, um, especially in a moment where um, we're we're socially distant or I would say physically distant from each other, um, and I'm, I'm I'm isolated from the communities that I want to be engaged in um, physically. Um, I, I do feel like there is this added um, nefarious nature of social media that can create anxiety. Um, it helps you maybe even to, um, I think it, it, it engages uh, this thought around fear and um, powerlessness because you're living through the screen and trying to figure out what do I do with all this information? How, how do I make a change? Um, I disconnect from that so I can actually focus on how I can make a change. Um, and I'm not disconnected from what's happening. I'm actually more engaged in my community because I've centered myself. So um, I work really hard to make sure that I, I provide some quiet spaces in my mind to think. I make sure that I'm getting my rest. I have water next to me at all times. Um, I drink at least a gallon of water a day. It's not just great for your skin, it's great for your thinking. It helps you to rest. Um, but that nap ministry, if you don't follow it on Instagram, you need to go and find this person who is really just, radicalizing what it means to uh, create space for yourself um, and, and actually think about the power of rest. So um, that is something that I've, I've used more recently um, when I'm thinking about joy because, you know, yeah, the, 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 the cliche family, loved ones, blah, 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 but I need some time for me, you know, and I love my family, but I had enough of them. So I go into the living room and I tell them to go upstairs or go to their room or whatever because mama needs a nap. And and I don't feel guilty in, in, in creating spaces for myself that are insular because I that's the way I recharge. And I appreciate that. Something around like maybe the end of May, June that I really started doing is just doing meditation. And meditation for me, like I took a whole meditation class in undergrad, just to let you all know. Um, but it's just something I re really didn't know how to do in practice. And just being able, like Shauna said, to just isolate and just shut down and just disconnect has just been so important. And it's been helpful because you really learn who you are when you're by yourself, right? And I think a part of this whole pandemic and shelter in place, like we're seeing a lot of things of ourselves, which is a, a gift and a curse, right? Because then you see the things that you really, really love and you see the things that you don't like, but you have the opportunity to really think about what can I do about this, right? How can I pour back into myself? If I am still depleted, how am I replenishing myself? Who am I intentionally connecting to to be able to do some of this? Uh, even for me, because I'm in New York, I also live in a hot spot. So you, you see what's going on in the news. But I love to go out with my windows open in my car. And I will be, do, will be doing that till December. I don't really care at this point because I just want to be able to get out and just experience outside and experience the goodness of just being in nature and being outside. So really just finding different ways or means to replenish. And I love the that ministry because especially with some of my identities thinking about about myself as a West Indian woman, like we overwork ourselves for everything. And it's like sometimes, especially black women will feel guilty about taking a break or feel guilty that I have to stop even though I still have work to do. But it's like, you need to stop because you're not gonna be able to get it done because you can't think. So you actually just need to like step back and be able to say, let me put it down. I'll come back with fresh eyes to be able to reprocess and move forward. But really just finding the liberation and saying it's okay to, to rest and it's okay to take a nap. Most of my naps are sleep, so that's not really helpful, but it's okay to take a nap in theory. <laughs> well, I know Crystal's on here and I know that she's listening. And I think something else that um, I've noticed some folks using is uh, um, an actual literal uh, reconnection to the land as well. Um, folks are gardening and thinking about what it means to, to create in that way. 
And um, I think it's really necessary to remember um, the ties that we should be having to the earth, um, to the resources that are around us, because um, that, that's what we emerge from, that's what we return to. And so I think in, in making sure that we're re-engaging in the, the natural resources and organic materials, um, we're also finding a way um, to, to re-engage in the energy that created us in the first place. And I know that's really theoretical and heady, but that's just where I'm at. Um, I think that is really necessary for us to think about um, different ways we can strategically um, engage in the land. Um, I'm originally from Detroit, some of y'all might know, and um, we're thinking about what it means to purchase land right now in a moment of gentrification um, and what it means to give land back to um, the communities that uh, owned it in the first place. And we're talking about indigenous people here. So um, I think trying to think about what ways that we can um, recenter our energies and, and go and beyond our physical selves and thinking about how that does tie back into the earth. I think that's also critical. I love it, y'all. I love it all. <laughs> well, I think we're, we're reaching that threshold where folks will start to, to tune out. So I'll pass it back to Bethany. Thank you both. Thank you so very, very much for participating in this conversation today. And thank you to everyone who joined us live. Um, and we certainly invite you to continue these conversations and affirm that Black Lives Matter through action. So joining in community with ACPA entity groups and engaging in the dialogue that will transpire during our ACP 20, ACPA 21 virtual convention this upcoming March are just a few ways you can start that process. To learn more about getting involved or registering for convention, you can visit myacpa.org. You can also reach out to us on social media to learn more ways about how to get involved and dive deeper into these conversations. There are some additional resources and messages of gratitude to our Black colleagues that are being shared across our social media channels all day today to highlight member stories, connections, and experiences. So please check those out if you are able and consider sharing one of your own. Um, and just a reminder, the session was recorded and captions will be embedded within the video within 24 hours as a video in our Facebook library. So please encourage colleagues to review at a later date if they were unable to join us here in live time today. Um, and I would just like to say thank you again for joining and I wish everyone the best as we continue to navigate these times together as a community who boldly transforms higher education. Thank you so much. Thank you.